Uh, there are a few buildings still in existence it's more associated with the horrors of the Holocaust than the entrance guard house at the gates of the concentration camp at Auschwitz-Birkenau, which you see here. This is not a piece of architecture as we like to think of it. We are so familiar with this building that we really don't see it anymore. It appears on the covers of books, the opening shots of documentaries, Hollywood films, uh, and has shown up in countless other works of art and other kinds of productions, and of course is often referenced in survivor testimony. We see it as always the stable, massive, and symbolic form that it is. And yet, it is not only a static symbol, that is a symbolic symbol, but it's also a product in time, of course, whose final form resulted from many hands that constructed the building and who changed its meaning. Still, nevertheless, when we think about this in the scholarship, we think about this building as very much one of genocide, not of architecture. But today I would like to think of this building not as a symbol of genocide per se, but rather as part of the genocidal process. Or in other words, we should move our attention from the overall symbolic significance of the building and think about its individual forms as they exist over time, or to use Marvin Trachtenberg's formulation, a building in time. Let us zoom in, for example, on a detail. Here you see something that disrupts our attention, a seam in the brickwork. It is just to the right of the central tower as one approaches the facade. Once one sees it, it is hard not to notice it over and over again in the pictures of the building, although to my knowledge it's never been referenced. It has been hiding in plain sight. This seam is a mark of the building as process, a building that is not static. The extension of the gate of Birkenau, the adding of a new wing onto the old building at this very seam, indicates a rise in the ambitions of the SS in this moment of 1943. These ambitions saw no contradiction between murdering more of Europe's Jewish population and expanding the capacity to work to death tens of thousands of others not immediately sent to their death. But this institutional perspective of the perpetrator is not the whole story. For it had to be constructed. Bricks and mortar had to be brought to this site along with cement. Foundations were dug, pipes were laid. Amidst all of this, the bricklayers also clearly attended to detail at a smaller level. Uh, for example, aligning the beveled cornice with three diagonally placed rows of brick to establish unity with the previous structure completed in 1942. And all of this work? Forced labor, of course. We cannot lose sight of the fact that the building represents the actions of victims as well. It is a sign of their oppression or occasionally their acts of survival. From the generation of designs to the coordination of construction to the hauling of materials to the laying of bricks, the building process was one in which SS goals intersected with victims' experience. They had wildly different understandings of this grotesque site, of course. But it was here, in space, at this seam, that we see the evidence of how individual histories and architectural ambitions converged in 1943. Now, my talk today is about this historical and spatial convergence in the building process. Buildings are important sites that evidence the ideologically driven plans of the Holocaust but they also leave traces of the victims that constructed or experienced these places as they moved through the genocidal system. In this sense, they are an ideal and overlooked source for exploring what Saul Friedlander famously called an integrated history of the Holocaust. For Friedlander, a history of the Holocaust requires both an understanding of the perpetrator policies, but also victims' beliefs and experiences. I will argue that the architecture of the Holocaust is one such way of discussing and analyzing a more profound integrated history. These places were designed, built, and experienced, but none of these mo moments is reducible to the other. They must each be seen in tension with each other as crucial aspects of the history of the Holocaust. To return to the seam in the brick, certainly it is a product of SS ideological ambition but it is also a trace of the lives and actions of those Jewish forced laborers, some of whom survived, and think of evidence like that trace as a way of marking and recalling important aspects of their experience. Our history of the building in particular, and the Holocaust in general, is not one or the other, but both. 
while we would, would traverse a wide field of evidence, my presentation will look closely at three distinct sources, a plan, a testimony, and a digital map. Each tells us something different. Together, they do not create a seamless narrative, but rather a relational one. Each part conveys a particular aspect of the Holocaust. First, the architectural plan speaks to the development and implementation of the perverse ideological goals of the SS, which included the brutal use of European Jews and other victims as forced laborers. Second, and conversely, the survivor's testimony has little interest in discussing the larger goals of forced labor, but rather focuses in on the experiential, a personal level of understanding. Here we see the importance of specific events at particular moments and in particular spaces. Third and finally, I will explore how these two different aspects can be modeled in the digital environment. None of these kinds of sources is a complete history, but together they form what I will call a relational one, a true integrated history of the Holocaust that works towards a total understanding of the event must by definition be a relational one. It is only by thinking relationally that we do not lose the survivor's story in the vast abstraction of a systemic analysis of the concentration camp network. Each is preserved and also kept as distinct, but each is necessary to explaining the Holocaust. And I will argue that the digital map helps us to clarify that relationship. Now, my reliance on digital mapping, a component of what is generally known as digital humanities, is not meant as just another attempt to justify digital humanities as the next big thing. Uh, you can find plenty of that in the pages of the New York Times. Rather, my analysis here is a defense of digital mapping as a conceptual method that not only contributes to our understanding of the Holocaust, but is also particularly methodologically suited to the kinds of historical questions we ask of the Holocaust. In many respects, I am arguing that Holocaust studies inevitably involves grappling with the vast scale of the event and its documentary evidence, as well as the intimate scale of the individual victim. And it is difficult to negotiate both of those focuses without the digital, that is to keep the individual and the systemic in relationship to each other. The digital here is not the truth. For a database and visualization in a map have serious limitations well known and debated in the digital humanities communities itself. But the digital map here functions morphologically, or in other words, it gives form to the relationship of the individual to the systemic. We need new approaches such as digital mapping, but used relationally to other historical sources so that we can see the form of that more complete history of the Holocaust a goal which is worthy of our students, our institutions, and ourselves. Let us start with the plan. What you see on the screen is a 1942 plan for changes to the main camp, or Auschwitz I, as it was known, along with the surrounding areas. Now, for those who have not visited the memorial, Auschwitz is actually three sites. Auschwitz I, the main camp which opened in 1940. Auschwitz II, or Auschwitz-Birkenau, a camp to house forced laborers and to murder Jews and others in the gas chambers. And Auschwitz III, or Monowitz, an industrial forced labor site. SS Untersturmführer Lothar Hachenstein finished this new plan, which you see here, for Auschwitz I on 12th of November of 1942. While it is a particularly finished drawing, it is one among thousands of other drawings that remain concerning Auschwitz, with some coming from the central office of the SS administration in Berlin, such as this one, but others made in the central building office, or Zentralbauleitung, of the camp itself. And I, I would note that, of course, many of the key drawings and uh, uh, crucial aspects of the plan have been studied uh, by people, uh, scholars of whom I'm very, very much indebted. And speaking locally, we are all indebted to the work of Robert Jan van Pelt, uh, upon whose work I build here, and I just show you his, uh, his uh, volume with Deborah Dvork in the center there. This plan, though, is also quite particular, that it's not only part of this general uh, schema of drawings, it's also quite specific, coming as it does in a very, very particular moment of the camp's history and the building activities of the Central Building Administration. It gives us insight into the dynamic between architecture and oppression, culture, and genocide. Certainly, it is not a particularly innovative or surprising design. 
The curved roads of the SS settlements on each side of the camp were standard in housing estate planning since the Garden City movement of the 19th century. And the regular institutional layout of the inmate spaces, as well as the alignment of the forced labor sites on the left along a central axis road, represent the kind of quote-unquote rational planning typical in industrial and penal sites in the modern era. But the use of color, as well as the spatial and temporal scales of the plan, are worth noting, since these are formal characteristics that help us to understand the Holocaust from the perpetrator's perspective. Note, for example, that the orange and greenish-blue complementary colors are only in the central section of the plan, drawing our attention. These are the areas focused on industrial forced labor, like the Krupp work to the left, the new SS administrative headquarters, and housing for the forced labor inmate population. But these areas are not only visually prioritized, they are also temporally prioritized as well. The key at the base of the map shows us that the building office was very much aware at any given moment uh, which buildings in this highlighted section were planned, under construction, or finished, that is, building in time. Finally, the plan also makes us think of time in multiple scales. There is the macro focus on time for the prioritized buildings in the middle, whereas the plan in itself represents macro time for its institutional future of the SS as a power in the center of the East. The housing estate, for example, are all about the future. The SS conceived of immediate needs, strategically highlighted in color and prioritized in relationship to the war, expansion of administrative spaces, and the ability to hold and oppress more inmates, both Jewish and non-Jewish. At the same time, though, it never lost sight of its ambition for a dominant future, a future marked by cities and settlements over the eastern lands, freed of Jews, Slavs, and others deemed inferior. To put it in blunt terms, the implementation of the plan, its conceptual framework, required genocide. It shows how deeply genocidal thought was spatial thought, which absorbed all aspects of life. Future time and the strategic current time cannot be separated, only prioritized. Building the future involved planning the present with forced labor and genocide a requirement for each. Note as well the large-scale planning involved in Hartenstein's drawing, particularly as it incorporated the urban scale size of the composition and the interest in thinking about multifunctional sites, that is, labor, industry, settlement. In particular, spatial scale was as important to their conceptual thinking as the temporal scale just discussed. Gesundheit. The SS was concerned with design at the smallest spatial scale of the building, evidenced by thousands of drawings and details. But they also were active in urban and regional planning, as indicated by this plan. And further, they organized building activity also at the continental scale of the war, such as the mobile building brigades of forced laborers, which could travel all over Germany and the occupied areas to support strategic building initiatives. Hartenstein's plan here is further evidence of that kind of thinking, where the parts of the site are made into a synthetic whole. For these architects, the present and future world were vast in scale, and scale, expressed in human terms, is control over building and space. However, this perpetrator's view belies evidence of who was doing the building. Here, the ideologically perfect world of the plan drives us back into the archive to see the messiness of the building process. Hartenstein's neat categories of time and space fall apart in the face of a complex world of day-to-day -day construction with thousands of orders for materials, working drawings, shipments of cement and wood, and of course, labor allocations. The SS solved these logistical problems by throwing at this task the one resource most at, at its disposal, the forced labor of Jewish and non-Jewish prisoners not immediately selected for murder in the gas chambers. The records from Auschwitz, though partial, are stunning in what they reveal about the involvement of architecture in forced labor. We are able, for example, to get a particularly good view into the scale of forced labor in construction from monthly reports for 1942, at the same time Hartenstein was working on his plan. While there are spikes and troughs in the numbers, by July of that year, 
at least 8,530 men and 3,200 women were at work daily as forced laborers in construction, a number that remains above 5,000 combined even in December, a very high figure considering that time of year. Note as well, by at least July of 1942, forced labor also included at least 160 prisoners working as draftsmen in the office of the Central Bauleitung itself. And I show you the mark of one such draftsman on a plan. What do we make of these numbers? On the one hand, they clearly correspond to the optimistic flurry of planning and activity for the camp in late 1942, so evident in the Hartenstein plan as well as the shift in labor at Auschwitz towards the armaments economy that gathers steam in 1943. On the other hand, though, these numbers highlight what scholars have not really talked about, that is, how much of the daily life of forced labor inmates in these years was occupied by the often brutal work of construction, hauling materials, digging foundations, laying pikes, hammering, lifting, etc. Finally, the sheer size of the labor force, as well as its variability, and I think this is the largest building office I've been able to find in Nazi Europe, including forced labor architects and draftsmen, highlight what a priority this was for the SS. But was this just a focus at Auschwitz? How systemic was this interest in construction for the SS and the camp system as a whole? Let's turn briefly to that question in order to expand the significance of our analysis of the Hartenstein plan. My co-author, Ann Kelly Knowles, and I have explored the camp system through Geographic Information Systems, or GIS. We use GIS to visualize the camp's database that form the core of Volume 1 of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's Camp Encyclopedia Project. Of the over 1,100 camps, uh, about 188 uh, 100, yeah, 188 have no specific labor construction. That is, we weren't able to put them on a, 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 a map for labor. But of the 923 remaining, 40% list construction as a primary or secondary goal of forced labor. This is compared to the 32% with armaments production as either a primary or secondary activity. The map you see of this data also visualizes the clear clustering of camps, for example, the red dots in the center, at which armaments production was a primary function of forced labor. Construction sites were focused more along the periphery of the overall system. In some, subcamps with a major emphasis on construction were more dispersed. Extending the empire out emphasized previously overlooked forced labor tasks of construction, while consolidation near the core reflected the commonly known scholarly emphasis on armaments production. And when I say commonly known, I cannot point you to a book anywhere in any language that focuses on construction as forced labor activity. Not one. At, at the system level, of course, Robert Jan van Pelt is focused on the local level. Construction's role in the SS system as a whole indicates a much larger function of this labor and its impact on the individual inmate worker's experience than previously assumed. And yet, however, much the plan has allowed us to spin out an analysis of various aspects of SS ideology and the scale of Nazi genocidal ambition, such a system-wide analysis also obscures. For example, we might follow this map and conclude that women's camps were less involved with construction than men. It could be easy to ascribe this to the manual labor of construction work, seemingly more suitable to men. But we know all too well that the Nazi apparatus had no such subtle parsing of labor and gender when it comes to victim groups. Indeed, women were just as likely to be involved in difficult physical labor as men, and it affected their chances of survival in the brutal implementation of the Holocaust just the same. The plan and the attendant maps I have shown is only one part of the story, and like any focus on explaining the perpetrator, it can obscure more important questions about victims and survivors. This becomes clear if we turn to our second kind of evidence tonight, the experience of individual European Jews and what they remember in their testimonies about the architecture of the Holocaust. There has, of course, been important work on survivor testimonies as an invaluable source for understanding the ethical and social dimensions of the Holocaust. And here I point to, most recently, Noah Shanker's work, uh, which I really think is an extraordinary uh, book on the various uh, testimony uh, archives, so I highly recommend it. 
Testimony has both a common and a deep component as it has been studied. The common elements of testimony are those moments when survivors describe how their story intersects with known historical and geographic arc of the Holocaust, such as their discussion of a group transport to Auschwitz or the organizations of their observations in a chronological ordered series of events that ends with liberation. So that's the common uh, way of describing it. But the deep element is what interests us here. Those components are the moments in which the individual survivor reveals a specific experience, perception, or story that is about their very particular place in time and space. These micro moments can often be abrupt interruptions of the testimony or be remembered only in fragments with chronological and spatial references that may or may not fit neatly into a larger historical narrative of the shared experience of genocide. It is worth recalling that uh, for those of us who have watched a lot of testimony, the briefness of a mention of an event is not an indication of its importance. Uh, for example, in the Shoah Foundation, which are the testimonies I'll be looking at today, it's a three-hour format, and given a three hours when you have to narrate your entire life, it doesn't leave a lot of time for dwelling on any specific incident. So the fact that you talk about something for 20 seconds doesn't necessarily mean it's a minor part of your story. It may be actually quite significant. That is to say, it may be a deep element. And, of course, when we talk about women speaking to the brutal building policies of the SS, and how that affected large groups of inmates, uh, we can also see that women discuss this in very particular ways. Their own construction forced labor, in this sense, it is rarely any sense of what the building actually was that they were working on. Uh, so if you've seen testimony and you come across a man who has been constructing, inevitably the next question asked by the interviewer is, what building were you working on? That is not the pattern of testimony when women talk about construction activity. The interviewer inevitably moves to another topic. More often, it, it, the, the construction activity of women is an eruption in the narrative and has to do with how particular spaces were experienced at specific times and how construction work came in at a specific moment. That is to say, the spatial and temporal scale of building in time for women is fragmented and occurs at the micro level of the body when we're talking about testimony. Now I want to focus on the particular case to expand on this point, the case of Bella Korn, a Polish Jew born in Łódź in 1923. To give this case some context, we can point to some common patterns in how Jewish women discussed building and construction work. Now my initial sample here is drawn from 26 survivor testimonies of women who, like Korn, were forced to build either immediately before, during, or after their time at Auschwitz. Most of these women were in Auschwitz in the SS system in mid-1944 and after. That is, at the same time that the SS was expanding its forced labor operations to coordinate with the last-ditch buildup of the armaments industry. This was not the optimistic moment of the plan that we've already discussed but rather the desperate moment before the final collapse of the German war effort. In viewing these testimonies, it becomes immediately clear not only that the women see the built environment differently, as of course we know, but that their understanding of building is literally the exact opposite of the SS perspective we have just seen. To remind ourselves, the SS emphasized cultural values, long-term temporal shifts in construction activity, multifunctionality of spaces, and some attention to aesthetics. For the women, however, to a person, they can't even see the building as a whole, let alone as a space that was either a synthetic part of an institutional policy or functioned as any kind of architectural or ideological symbol. The women described the buildings they worked on, as well as those they lived in, as fragments made up of rooms, specific signs like a chimney, or merely as a site, a kitchen, a toilet, a gate. Several of the women merely used the phrase, a place, to describe where they were. This radical fragmentation of space speaks not only to the trauma of these memories, which are always partial, but also to the reduction of space and building to its most basic constituent element of the here and now. Such inability to see space 
results from the dehumanization of Jewish women under Nazi control, in which the necessity of merely staying alive consumes all other powers of perception. In these terms, space in testimony is consistently ambiguous. And yet, as we have seen, Jewish and non-Jewish inmates were involved in not only experiencing these spaces, but also planting and building them. What's surprising is that they seem to have to insert this testimony about their construction work abruptly into the narrative to create the space of a deep element that signals this particular experience. These experiences seem to be such a departure from the common testimony that even the interviewers of the Shoah Foundation skip over their segments relatively quickly. But these women often repeat these moments, nevertheless, particularly by insisting on listing the banal labor tasks. Digging, lifting, carrying, hauling, and site clearing are the most often referenced terms with an emphasis on brick, stone, and cement. While they performed many other physically demanding tasks at the hands of the Nazi authorities, construction work consistently came forward as an extreme sign of their physical oppression even if it did provide them with a way to survive another day. As one survivor put it, quote, I had to work hard. I had to show that we were productive people, end quote. This summation and brief quotation provide context for the compelling testimony of survivor Bella Korn. At the time of her transport from the ghetto of Wuch in 1944, she had never heard of Auschwitz. Her transport arrived on August 28th. As with many testimonies, Korn is vague about specific agents, buildings, or functions. That is, in those aspects of her experience that could have overlapped most closely with the SS concerns. So she talks about being taken to quote unquote other rooms or saying that quote unquote they announced a selection for inmates to be taken to forced labor in Germany. At the same time, the built environment exists for her, like the other woman, women, as a series of fragments. For example, she says, near the chimneys, which she signifies as the crematorium. Korn, focused on memories of survival, pays little heed to policies or relationships of space and time, present and future. After only a few days in Auschwitz, she was at the Appellplatz for the selection for inmates to be sent to Germany. In a dramatic move, when she didn't hear her name called, she grabbed her sister and went over to the group of people being sent into forced labor because she thought it would be safer. This is what she describes as her Auschwitz escape. What follows this moment is an 11 and a half minute segment in which it is clear that the next months of her life included the experience of transport, work, and survival of the brutally cold winter of 1944-45 shared by many survivors and inmates. But it also included in exactly this period for her an activity that was punctuated by building. In this period, she worked at the forced labor sum camp of Langenbilau in Silesia in Germany, now in southern Poland. The camp was a subcamp of Grossrosen. Here, Korn remembers surviving at the moment of the construction of a barracks, that is literally her first memory, and a shower. And she herself was assigned to the task of constructing bunkers for air raids and quote unquote building long ditches, which she didn't know what they were for. She was then transported early in 1945 to Parschnitz, another subcamp of Grossrosen. She thinks she was there about three months, where she built more air raid shelters and more construction activities. Her description of the spaces through which she moved indicate her perception of the organizational structure of the SS system, that is, camp to subcamp. But the vague sense of chronology and the four distinct moments of construction which enter and then abruptly drop out of the testimony communicate clearly the fragmentary understanding of space and time that disrupt an otherwise coherent narrative. This heavy labor by a woman has been thus hiding in plain sight in the testimony, covered over by the otherwise more familiar, if equally brutal, description of women and other inmates in the last few cold months of the war as they desperately fought to survive till liberation. Bella Korn's testimony is thus both familiar and unfamiliar. It is one of thousands of testimonies that speak to the degradation and oppression of the Nazi occupation of Europe. It affirms and expands our knowledge, reminding us not to forget each and every individual. It also, though, 
is less familiar in its insertion of the presence of forced labor construction activity on the role of that specific labor in her survival. The emphasis on air raid bunkers, for example, is picked up in other narratives of women so that it becomes clear that experiencing the forced labor events at the end of the Holocaust meant a constant process of destruction and construction as each side in the military conflict built up or destroyed the capacity of Germany to continue the war. This experience of the built environment had no many meaning in any cultural or symbolic sense from the women's point of view. Instead, like corn, the destruction of a factory one day meant only that they had to carry cement to the site to start rebuilding it the next. Time, as described in testimony, was reduced to one event following another, and conceptions of space were localized to the specific site of labor. These women might remember German terms used for their work, such as Bauarbeit, but any other connection to the SS plans for the site existed only in their endurance of the brutal daily experience of forced labor. But one thing is clear. The last year of the war for many survivors was spent in the midst of a very large construction site. Both my discussion of the SS plan for Auschwitz, as well as my focus on the testimony of Bella Korn, indicates how important our attention to time is in the analysis of the architecture of the Holocaust. This temporal dimension is crucial, for it both links and separates the two kinds of evidence. For the SS, the temporal scale rested on how present actions related to future ambitions in a tense but integrated relationship. Such concepts of time were matched by concepts of space, which connected the particular plans for a camp to the overall system of forced labor concentration camps. But for the victims, as we have seen, such a systemic and holistic sense of time or space were irrelevant. Time exists in testimony as only present as fragments of moments, just as spaces and buildings are marked not as whole structures, but as parts, walls, plazas, corners. The perpetrators were interested in a constant push for synthetic notions of time and space, while the victims placed an emphasis on phenomenological and fragmented experiences. But how, then, do we talk about the two temporal and spatial plans and experiences together? A digital animation of the construction of the Auschwitz during 1943 and early 1944 may help to give form to some of the issues raised by both the earlier SS plan of 1942 and the later Korn testimony of her experiences in 1944-45. Now, due to time constraints, you will forgive me. I'm showing you select stills from that animation rather than the animation as a whole. As with the previous camp system map, this animation resulted from my ongoing work with Ann Kelly Knowles on analyzing the spaces of the Holocaust through digital mapping and other visualization means. For the Auschwitz project, we were interested in reconstructing the buildings at the site in order to ask historical questions about what the built environment might tell us about the Holocaust. As we progressed with our research, Chester Harvey, our associate, developed a database of building at the sites, a database that included over 1,400 structures. These included both the large-scale monumental buildings which we're familiar with, like the entrance pavilion at Birkenau, but also small vernacular structures like a troop sauna at the eastern end of Auschwitz I. The scale of the SS ambition that we have seen marked in the plan was evident to us as we built the database. What we thought we were visualizing was this large-scale world of the SS as a first start to our reconstruction. Now, this moment of 1943-44 was important in the history of the camp. So it's between Hartenstein and Bella Korn. Yet while not overlooked, it is often downplayed by scholars. This is not surprising given the history of uh, the camp uh, in terms of Holocaust research. On the one hand, Scholars have emphasized the step-by-step -step radicalization of anti-Semitic policy by the perpetrators that led to the war and Auschwitz in the first place. Nazi policy escalated those attacks into full-scale genocide with the deployment of the Einsatzgruppen in the East after the beginning of the war. These mobile killing squads were gradually replaced with killing centers, including Auschwitz, beginning in 1941. By 1942, genocide was decidedly not a plan. It was reality for European Jewry and established policy in the death camps and at Auschwitz. 
Historians of that site then tend, tend to direct our focus to 1944 and the murder of over 400,000 Hungarian Jews at the camp, a horrific summer of death that summarizes all too well the results of anti-Semitic policy. Many survivors who were in Auschwitz have testimonies that also focus on 1944 and after, given that, not surprisingly, the end of the war is closer to their memory. In addition, for those who did survive, often their time at Auschwitz or through the forced labor subcamp system focused on the later years. Comparatively, fewer Jewish inmates survived the camps who were incarcerated at Auschwitz before or early in the war. Now, I am obviously generalizing here, and there are many exceptions to what I've just sketched, but I remind us of this dominant direction in historians' accounts and survivors' testimony since it clearly leaves a gap in the history of 1943. This is the gap between SS plans and the majority of survivor testimony that the animation addresses. Our initial visualizations focused on trying to make sense not of the visual elements of the SS plan, but rather its functional ones. That is, we were trying to capture the multifunctional spaces in order to visualize not just the major structures that are well known, but all of the buildings in between. This large scale map, for example, that you see here, gives some sense of that complexities of function. Focusing on one corner of that large scale map, the eastern corner of the main camp of Auschwitz I, this digitally marked up SS plan gives an example of that multifunctional space. As you can see, it includes a variety of SS buildings, from the domestic structure and garden of the Commandant at the bottom of the plan, to the troop housing and saunas, to the central building office, to the slaughterhouse for the camp canteen. But it also includes, at the upper left, visible inmate spaces, including, most obviously, the crematorium, which changed function several times in these years, and forced labor barracks and inmate housing. We were interested in how all of these functions could be in the same visual sight line and what, what we might make of that. This visualiz visualization and the larger one, larger one of which it is a part, indicates important factors for the analysis of Auschwitz. On the one hand, they show the lack of a rationally planned and controlled space, not the well-ordered world of the SS we might expect. On the other, they also show clearly that these were improvised short-term plans of the moment that put a place of relaxation, like a sauna, next to a food processing facility, next to an on-again, off-again crematorium. These spaces would be replaced by the long-term order and rationality of Hartenstein's plan that we've seen. Finally, and most importantly, they show at this moment of 1943 the physical and visual intersection of the world of the perpetrator and the world of the inmate, a world that was in the process of being constructed, as indicated by the underlying architectural sketch which you see here. This last element of the process of construction, though, can only be inferred from the plan or from our digital reconstruction. Building in time is something we can only describe as related to, but outside of this particular visualization. The finalized animation gives us a very different, and I believe radically new picture, of that gap in time at Auschwitz. One that argues for attending to the architecture of the Holocaust, as well as its construction. The animation is a simple version, visualization, excuse me, of our partial database of construction activity in Auschwitz-Birkenau beginning in April of 1943 and ending in May of 1944, just before the arrival of the Hungarian Jews. The light red spaces indicate that construction activity had been completed, excuse me, was remaining in process, whereas the saturated red dark spaces indicate that construction had been completed and the building office had turned the finished structure over to the camp administration. Now, I hope you can see by these screenshots how the animation captures two aspects of the development of the built environment of Auschwitz-Birkenau very clearly. First, it shows the rapid expansion and growth of the physical scale of the camp. Expansion of finished dark red buildings in the visualization exists as an indexical mark of the temporal and spatial conceptualizations of the space or to put it in terms of Hartenstein's 1942 plan, what we see here is the spatial expansion and ideological commitment of the SS to implement its twin goals of extending forced labor 
and genocidal ambition, which required this spatial plan. For this, they needed to expand the capacity of Birkenau to hold forced laborers, but also to have spaces to keep inmates before their subsequent murder in the newly finished crematorium gas chambers at the northwest corner of the camp. These goals required larger controlled spaces that were also highly regulated, marked in the organization and expansion of the camp. But second, it also shows how sporadic and chaotic that expansion was over this year period of time. There is no set pattern to the construction process at the site. Rather, such ambitions to expand power, even by the SS, face the constant day-to-day -day challenges of the war, of common conditions of building, such as weather and the shortage of materials, and of their own brutal hand over forced labor construction. That is to say, the micro, ever-changing image of the construction zone of Birkenau also points directly to the prisoners to those Jewish and non-Jewish inmates who came into this physically fluid and confusing environment. That is to say, they didn't start building from one end of the camp to the other, from one section to the next. It was building at all different points at all different times and spaces. Since the digital reveals building in time, it further points to those thousands of prisoners whose daily existence was in constructing this environment. The animation refers to both ambition and to construction, to long-term goals, but also to the short-term experience of space and the moment. Another way of thinking about this intersection of temporal scales in space is this graph, based on the same database, but visualized in a different way. So in other words, it's a different kind of map. The graph shows how consistent construction activity was over this period, given that the central building office was in a constant state of activity. It captures the daily scale of building, something so granular that only visualization based on the detail of a database can really help us to see it. But it not only shows the consistency of construction activity, but rather the dips and troughs of the graph indicate the start and stop process of the implementations of the plan of this scale at this moment in the war and with the use of forced labor. Buildings could be finished within a few weeks of planning or shortages could stop construction for a period or more brutally the thousands of forced laborers could be called at any particular time to another aspect of camp work to fulfill yet a different aspect of the Nazi military and genocidal ambition. In addition to indicating the central building office's perspective, though, the graph also references the activity of prisoners, their real life not only in construction work, but also in an ever-changing built environment. One, the peaks and valleys of this chart emphasize a constantly changing physical space, one which was visually unpredictable, making their experience of space ever more fragmented and random. That is to say, the graph shows the spaces that appear not in the polished plans and memorandum of the SS, but the spaces that show up in the testimony. Why would any survivor remember a plan or have a total concept of a site or understand the relation of one building to another? Indeed, our graph indicates that such disjointed memories are not only the product of the nature of testimony 50 years after the end of the war. The graph is also, and surprisingly, much closer to visualizing the actual character and experience of space in the camps itself. In a world of construction, of physical environments, and of constantly adjusting plans and ambitions, the fragmented description of spaces and forced labor, so evident in Bellicorn's testimony and others, are the most accurate description of the architecture of the Holocaust. This is what the architecture looks like, and this is what Korn described. The digital visualizations help us to consider anew our historical sources. But they also bring us back to the historical question of an integrated history posed at the beginning of this talk. The graft and the animation are, of course, abstractions. They do not represent reality any more than any other computer environment. The code, the database structure, and indeed the projecting machine itself are just part of the mediating role played by the digital environment in which we have reduced human actions and experiences to pixels and bytes. 
These partial and faulty representations, though, still show the indexical power of the digital environment when used for historical analysis. They do not represent reality, but they do refer to real plans, actions, and experience. They mark the traces of history and give them form, preserving both the resonance of the overall plan of the SS, but also marking the daily experience of Jewish victims. The animation and its attendant graph references both. It makes us ask questions of both, but it does not reduce one to the other. They are spatially related, and that relational moment of their physical confluence signals as well their relational history. Through visualizing the architecture of the Holocaust as building in time, we critique a monolithic view of the long-term goals of the SS by showing their need to be built step by step, brick by brick, cement bag by cement bag. But importantly, we also recover more clearly traces of the inmates' experiences of forced labor, validating and contextualizing the testimony of those post-war survivors. The digital is not a replacement for an analysis of the document or the testimony. It merely gives form to their relationship and shows how we can start to talk about both the systemic and individual questions in the Holocaust together. Now what I've tried to argue here was how looking at construction can change not only our analysis of the built environment, but give greater complexity to an integrated history of the Holocaust. Architecture as process could be a unique resource for Holocaust studies as we become more and more interested in a diverse set of spaces, from ghettos to camps, from front lines to bombed cities, from post-war trial rooms to living room testimonies. The digital methods have been important here, but only as part of this broader, deeply humanistic project. Attending to architecture not only gives us a side history, but a central component of the overall implementation and experience of the Holocaust. If we do not attend to questions raised by the seam in the wall at the entrance of Auschwitz-Birkenau, we lose sight of fundamental characteristics of the perpetrator. But we also cast the terrible experience of forced labor construction by thousands of victims into darkness. The trace of their experience, which resonates with the testimony of many women survivors, must be remembered but also explained. As I hope I have shown, visualizing building as process goes a long way towards just such an explanation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, what a blend of the disciplines in order to answer.